All right, so if we want to talk about uh, comparative climatology of terrestrial planets, um, obviously we need to be thinking about the sample size that is required to actually compare things. And I'll be talking about uh, sample sizes that we might get back from direct imaging missions in the future. Uh, I'm going to focus specifically for the majority of the talk on the yields that we expect for potentially Earth-like planets. And to directly image uh, an Earth-like planet, I'm going to add some zeros uh, to Nick's numbers there. It is 10 billion times fainter than its host star, and it's separated by less than 1 one hundredth the width of a human hair held at arm's length. So this is very challenging. We have to suppress starlight to do this. Um, if you don't, the diffracted starlight throughout your telescopic system will end up uh, just swamping the, the image. So we have to use some sort of instrument to do that, whether it be a chronograph or a starshade. We're going to create a dark zone within which we can detect these faint planets. That dark zone is typically parameterized by contrast, which is just the degree of suppression, an outer working angle beyond which we can't detect planets, and an inner working angle interior to which we can't detect planets. And I should point out that this has been done on the ground before, albeit not to the same degree. Um, there are two instruments that are currently being studied that uh, have the potential of doing this, chronographs and starshades. Starshades are separate spacecraft that would fly up to about 100,000 kilometers away from the telescope. And we would just park it in between the telescope and the star that we're pointing at and basically block out the light. And it has to be this fancy shape for reasons I'm not going to get into. Um, I won't get into how these work at all, but I'll, I'll point out here some, some obvious observational strengths and weaknesses because in the end, we're going to use chronographs and starshades differently, um, and that means we'll get different data back from them. So starshades uh, are advantageous because you can at least design them to have a very wide band pass, so you can get very wide spectral coverage in one go. Also, their inner and outer working angles are independent of wavelengths. So if we see a planet in that dark zone, we're going to be able to observe it at all of those wavelengths for which the starshade is designed, unlike a chronograph. Um, some limitations, though, is that ultimately the yield will be uh, limited by the fuel. Every time we want to repoint the telescope, we have to slew that star shade across the sky a tremendous distance. And because of the tyranny of the rocket equation, this means that repointing is very costly. Um, in addition, we cannot reflect sunlight into the telescope, so there's a very specific orientation that, uh, that a star shade can be at on the sky. And for that reason, we won't really be able to optimize when we observe a given system to a great degree. You might have a month and a half out of a year in which you can observe a given star. Uh, chronographs are essentially the opposite. Instead of blocking light externally to the system, we allow uh, the starlight to, to enter the telescope, diffract all over the place, and then we have to go up and clean up the mess. So we have a bunch of, bunch of advanced optics and uh, deformable mirrors to do that. Uh, the strengths are because it's inside of the telescope, it's obviously much more nimble. You simply repoint the telescope. There is an overhead associated with redigging that dark hole, but overall it's a much more nimble uh, uh, instrument. If your telescope has a large field of regard, your chronograph will also have a large field of regard. Um, so for, for reference, both Habex and Louvoir are, uh, have fields of regard that are literally almost the entire sky at any given point in time, which means we can really optimize uh, the, the date in which we observe any system. Additionally, the yield is limited by time, not fuel. So at the, you know, if your nominal mission has two years of exoplanet time associated with it, uh, at the end of your nominal mission lifetime, if that time gets extended, uh, you'd be able to continue taking science. With the starshade, you'd have to go and actually refuel it and service it. Uh, observational limitations are that the band pass is relatively narrow, on the order of about 20%, and I'll show what that means here in just a minute. Uh, the inner working angle grows with wavelength, so if you see a planet at half a micron, that does not necessarily mean you will get to see it at one micron. Now, what do these uh, uh, spectral coverages typically look like? So Habex A's uh, starshade, as designed, is a very broad band pass. It extends from about 300 nanometers out to about 800, potentially even one micron. So in a single observation, you'd get spectral coverage of this whole range here for an Earth twin. You'd see you'd be able to de detect all sorts of interesting features. With a chronograph-based mission, we're typically talking about operating at least two chronographs in parallel. So during detections of planets, we'd probably straddle roughly 500 nanometers with these two chronographs and we'd get photometry there. And then we, when we choose to go take a spectrum, we'd probably have to focus on very specific features that we want to detect because we have a limited band pass. 
Now this can be filled in in between, but that means more time, fo more follow-up observations. Um, I also want to point out that, that because of these strengths and, and limitations, uh, it, it matters very much how you choose to operate that instrument. And so we've done yield calculations, here's yield as a function of telescope diameter, for different observing scenarios. So for a star shade, if you wanted to uh, first measure the orbits of all your planets and then choose those stars that have very interesting, potentially habitable planets in them in the habitable zone, and then follow up with spectral characterization, that would be a really inefficient way of doing things because repointing the star shade is very costly. And so as it turns out, we think that the most efficient way to observe with a star shade is actually to just take spectra all the time. Every single time you observe, you start taking a spectrum, and then you'd follow up only those very promising targets to measure their orbits. For a chronograph, this scenario is essentially the opposite. Chronographs actually prefer to go back multiple times to a system to increase completeness, which I'll discuss here in a minute. Um, and and uh, then you would choose very specific systems to spectrally characterize. So here you're going to get, with a chronograph, you're going to get lots of multi-epic color, lots of uh, um, orbit measurements. You're going to get fewer spectra. With a star shade, you're going to get more spectra, very few orbit determinations, and very few multi-epic imaging. All right, so I, I showed you some yields here. I want to get into how we actually calculate these very briefly. Uh, we use a piece of software that some people refer to as a design reference mission code. And basically what it does is it takes into account a very long list of input parameters um, and then executes or simulates the mission end-to-end uh, -end at a very high level. So we take into account astrophysical constraints, things that describe the universe as we know it, uh, assumptions about the planet, its albedo, its phase function, orbital distribution, etc. We take into account observational requirements like what wavelengths and uh, spectral resolutions we need, and then technical requirements, which is basically a really high fidelity model of our mission. How big of a telescope do we have? What is the geometry of the primary mirror? What is the performance of the chronograph? And we simulate end-to-end uh, -end the mission over its nominal lifetime. How do we do that? Okay, so what we are doing is we're trying to estimate the yield of planets. We don't know which stars these planets are going to be around ahead of time. So right now we're simulating a blind survey for these sorts of planets. And how we do that is we take every star in the Hipparchos and Gaia catalogs within about 50 parsecs, and around every single star we'll distribute a very large number of synthetic planets of a given type. So here we might distribute a million synthetic exo-Earths around a given star. And then we calculate a quantity called completeness. Completeness is the fraction of those synthetic exo-Earths that we can detect in a given observation if that type of planet exists. So as you can see here with this telescope, this synthetic cloud of exoers, some of them are behind the inner working angle of our instrument, and we won't be able to, to detect them regardless of how long we expose. Another fraction of them happen to be in crescent phase, and so they're simply too faint to detect within a reasonable exposure time tau, and the fraction that remains is completeness. Uh, the yield of this observation would simply be the product of completeness and the probability that the planet actually does exist, which in this case is eta Earth. Um, so what's unique about our code is we recognize that completeness is a function of exposure time. And so what we do is we, we take that function of exposure time, we calculate its derivative, and we use this to optimally distribute exposure time to different observations. In fact, we optimize many aspects of the observations. We optimize which stars are selected for observation, how many visits to each star, the delay time between stars, uh, which coronagraph is assigned to which star, and this is all done with the intent, in the end, to maximize the yield of the mission. And the point of this is, is that we don't want to approach this with some assumption about how the observation should be executed. We want the code to tell us what is the most efficient way to actually execute them. All right, so very briefly, we have adopted a universe of planets. Uh, it's a very simplistic three by five grid of planets. We have hot, warm, and cold planets of different sizes. This is in Robbie's recent paper. A subset of them we are calling exo-Earth candidates, uh, 0.95 to 1.7 AU for a solar twin. Um, and then we calculated yield for three very specific and critical uh, design decisions, whether we should have a monolith or a segmented telescope. It's been largely believed that monoliths, have, uh, you can design a better chronograph with a monolithic mirror, but you can only get so big with that. Uh, we looked at off-axis and on-axis secondary mirrors, and then we looked at the inclusion of a UV channel. So 
If we demand that we have access to the UV, it turns out that that will reduce the throughput of the entire system quite dramatically, and you'll see that as a result. So I've uh, calculated yields for all of these different uh, design trades, um, and I've sort of summarized the results here in a single plot. So this is yield versus telescope diameter. The green region down here is where we, we can design a monolithic mirror less than about four or four and a half meters. And we have the, we have, in this region, we've evaluated yield using the best coronagraph that we compare with that particular telescope. As you go larger in diameter, you have to go to a segmented telescope, but you can stay off axis. And there, we, again, we've selected the best uh, chronograph design there. Once you get to about eight or nine meters, the secondary mirror is so far away that you have to switch to an on-axis telescope. Uh, it's just un unreasonably large. And when you switch to an on-axis telescope, obviously there's a significant penalty in yield. And that's because you have to switch chronograph designs at that point. And there, it's not as, uh, it doesn't have the same performance level as the other chronograph. A few notes, the lower limit here, th this is spread is not due to astrophysical uncertainty or anything like that. This is simply if you demand access to the UV, you will get a lower yield than if you uh, have two visible chronographs because the throughput is lower. Um, there's no obvious yield penalty for going to a segmented telescope. There is an obvious yield penalty for going to a non-access telescope. But I want to point out that if I had presented this about three years ago, this whole blue region would be zero. There were no on-axis chronograph designs with segmented mirrors that could perform well at all. So just in the last three years, we've gone from zero to designs that we think can achieve a, uh, quite, quite a good yield. And we think that uh, we're going to uh, improve these as well in the future. Starshade only missions are going to be down here. They're fuel limited. Um, here's where HabX A, Luvar B, and Luvar A would reside on this plot. And I'm out of time. So I'll very quickly show that while we're hunting for these Exoworth candidates here shown in green with HabEx, we're going to get dozens of all sorts of other types of planets along the way for free. Um, so HabEx, you're going to see, you know, dozens of different types of planets. Luvar, I think, would really usher in a completely new era of uh, comparative uh, planetology. And with that, I'll take questions. We have time for questions. How, how easy is it to calibrate the DC offset between different bits of the spectrum um, when, you, when you have to get your spectrum piecemeal? Because in the transit spectroscopy world, this is like a notorious problem. You get a little piece of spectrum and you get a different instrument on a different gig, get another piece of spectrum, and then there's like a lot of slop there, right. which is gonna make it hard to understand the overall shape of the spectrum of the planet. Yeah, so that, I mean, that is an inherent problem. When, it, when we go to observe these, some of these exposure times are uh, days, weeks, uh, potentially a month, depending on what you're trying to detect. So you will be detecting the planet at different phases um, and getting all of that synced up is going to be very difficult. Time for maybe one more question. Could you go back to the figure where you plotted on Habex and Louvre on your? I will. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, can you go back one more slide where you showed that UV line? Yeah, that penalty doesn't look so bad, and you get a huge chunk of another community involved because there's nothing going well, in the UV so in the space for a long let, time. Let me be clear: this is okay. not about the UV performance of the telescope in general. Okay. This is about the UV performance of the chronograph. Uh -huh. So, just okay. requiring a UV chronograph means that you have four or five extra optics that are aluminum coated as opposed to silver coated, and that reduces the throughput of not just the UV chronograph but the, the visible chronograph as well. Is there a way to just remove the chronograph? Because you know. You can remove the chronograph, and then these yields would all be zero. No, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, an active for the other community. I mean, you you build a telescope UV optimated, but you have a chronograph that can be taken in or out. Is that is this that's just too, compli too complicated? Complicated. Um, so so right now, the choice is either to have a Luvar is going to have UV capability for all science instruments. Right. Um, and at a minimum, that means you have two two reflections that are aluminum coated, probably more like four. Um, and then the chronograph, if you want just visible chronographs, then everything can be silver after that point. Right. If you demand that one of the chronographs be UV, then you have at least another three or four uh, cool. aluminum reflections. Thank you.